Hello everyone, my name is Clantus and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. So before I go any further, I would kindly like to ask you to please like this video because guys, when you like a YouTube video, you are actually helping the content creator with the YouTube algorithm to promote the video to as many people as possible so that it gives the channel a chance to grow. So if you are just going to watch my videos without liking, then you are actually hurting my channel from getting a chance to grow. So I kindly ask you to please give my videos a like so that the algorithm can push my videos to more people. Definitely, I would like to see my channel grow and hit 1 million subscribers someday in the future. And also, if you are new to this channel, please do consider subscribing and click the bell notification so you do not miss out on any of my true crime uploads. So without further ado, let's get into today's video and I'll be covering 10 most ruthless South African killers. So at number 10, we have Jack Mohale, the West End serial killer. Jack lured his victims by claiming that he was a Zion Christian church prophet and pastor. Due to the false titles, he managed to convince unsuspecting women to take them to the West End brick and clay factory where he claimed that he lived and worked. Immediately, he and his victims arrived. He would then offer them something to drink laced with drugs. And once the victim is drugged, he would then kill them. However, his last two women survived his evil deeds and would report him to the police. On his trial, one of the survivors testified in court, telling the court that he had offered her a ride and during the ride, he had prophesied to her. Jack then took a route or a route that looked isolated and quiet and that is when he ruthlessly started to attack her. In 2008 and 2009, Jack Mohale had murdered 16 women and at the end of his trial in 2011, he was sentenced to 60 life prison terms and an additional 23 years in prison for the attempted murder of his survivors and he has no chance of getting paroled. At number 9, Jimmy Maketa, the Jesus Killer Victims of Jimmy Maketa, who survived his ruthless attack, said that he had a tattoo or what looked like a drawing on his upper lips as well as on his forehead that read Jesus, hence the Jesus Killer. Jimmy Maketa lived in the bushes after being kicked out of the house by his wife who just divorced him. On the hills where he lived, he would hide in bushes and suss out the movement of people and possible victims who were farm workers in Philippi, Cape Town. The farm workers in Philippi were known to drink cheap wine and would always seem to be out of it and that is when Jimmy will take advantage of their state of intoxication by raping and murdering them using a hammer and sometimes an axe. After raping and murdering them, he would dump their bodies in a dam near the Philippi community for the kids to find. In December of 2005, Jimmy Maketa was caught after an informant gave him up to the police. Mind you, Jimmy had tormented the police by writing letters and even leaving the police a map of where they could find the next body. Jimmy was brought to court and in 2007, after a lengthy trial, he was found guilty of 47 charges, 19 counts of rape and 16 counts of murder. Five of his victims were elderly women of between the ages of 60 and 70 years old. At number 8, Elias Chitambuzi, the Pangaman Killer. This ruthless serial killer killed 16 men and women in Atridgeville, Pretoria, South Africa in the 1950s. As you would probably know, during this time in South African history, it was the days of apartheid and Elias targeted white people and white people panicked 
to find out that they were being targeted by a black man who was killing them. Ellis's killing weapon of choice was a panga or a machete in some parts of the world would call it. Ellis's murderous days came to an end when he sold a stolen watch that belonged to one of his victims. Ellis's trial was probably the shortest trial South Africa had ever since, as he was convicted of 16 murders and sentenced to death. On or about the 14th of November 1960, Elias Chitabudzi was hanged. At number 7, Stuart Wilkins, also known as the Booty Boer. Stuart Wilkins was born in Boxburg in the East Rand of Johannesburg, South Africa. However, after getting adopted by his neighbor as a very young boy, his adopted parents relocated to Port Elizabeth, the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. Stuart operated in Port Elizabeth, killing young boys and female prostitutes. One of his victims was his own daughter, whom he is also accused of eating, allegedly. Stuart Wilkins started killing as early as 1990 and was only caught in 1997. When he was asked why he had murdered his own daughter, he claimed that his daughter had told him that her stepfather was sexually abusing her. So, to take her out of her misery, he decided to strangle her to death. He considered this act as an act of mercy on his daughter by sending her soul to God to rest. Stuart also murdered the son of a friend after he had raped him and continued to sleep with the boy's decomposing body. Stuart also said that after murdering one of the prostitutes, he cut out her nipples and ate them. In the end, Stuart Wilkin was sentenced to seven life terms in prison and he is housed at St. Albany Correctional Services in the Eastern Cape. At number six, Norman Simons, also known as the Station Strangler. Norman Simons was a grade five teacher who was adored by children and he was also well loved and respected by his colleagues and community where he taught. Norman took advantage of the fact that he was well liked and his position as a teacher that gave him the best disguise that he is interested in young boys. In 1986, young boys started disappearing from train stations. They would later be found tied up, sodomized and strangled to death and sometimes they would be found in shallow graves. In 1994, a total of 11 bodies of young boys were found. Norman was finally identified by one of the boys whose friend had also disappeared. The teacher had asked him to assist him carry some heavy boxes for him. The boy then realized that the teacher, whom he respected and loved, had had him carry parts of his friend's body for disposal. After getting arrested, Norman Simons told the police that when he was a young boy himself, he was sodomized by his older brother. He further said that he would hear voices instructing him to murder his victims. When Norman Simons' trial concluded, he was only found guilty for one count of murder and was sentenced to 35 years in prison to which he is still in prison for. South Africans were livid to find out that he was convicted for only one murder when there were 22 young boys found sodomized, murdered and buried in shallow graves. The worst part, South Africans felt that 35 years was too lenient on Norman Simons. At number 5, Elifasim Somi, also known as the Axe Killer. Elifasim Somi operated in the 1950s, and in 1955, he was caught, prosecuted, and convicted to death by hanging for 15 counts of murder. 
Elias was a Zulu man who believed that he had a calling to heal people by becoming a Sangoma. Unfortunately, when he went for a professional training to become a Sangoma, he was told that he could not be a Sangoma as he had a dark spirit and that if he did become a Sangoma, he would use his powers to do evil. After being rejected, he then decided to go to another professional trainer whom he told that he was not allowed to become a Sangoma as he had a dark spirit. This particular professional trainer told him that there was a shortcut to becoming a Sangoma and that is to appease a Togoloshe. Indeed, a Togoloshe told him that it would need 15 bottles of human blood. In 1953, Elias Somi started his 18 months of killing spree in the south coast of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. And his first victim was murdered and collected her blood in a bottle in the presence of his girlfriend, trying to impress her. The girlfriend was mortified but pretended not to in front of him. However, the moment they parted ways, she ran straight to the police and reported him. Not long after his girlfriend reported him, Elias Msomi was arrested by the police. However, he escaped shortly after being thrown in jail, giving credit to the Togoloshe that took him out. Immediately after escaping, he continued murdering, and this time he had murdered five children and collected their blood in bottles. Elias Msomi was re-arrested and thrown in jail, but guess what? He escaped again, giving credit to the Togoloshe who told him that this time around he should not run, but simply walk through the jail cell. Not long after escaping, he was once again arrested, this time for trying to sell items of the women he had killed. During his trial, Elias claimed that he was possessed by the Togoloshe who forced him to kill. He told the court that he was innocent of it all. Elias Msomi, South Africa's ruthless killer, was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging at the Pretoria Central Prison, and nine chiefs from KwaZulu Natal had sought permission from the court to be present during his hanging just to make sure that the Togoloshe does not come and rescue him. However, one of the nine chiefs said if he did indeed die from the hanging, he will come back as the Togoloshe himself. At number 4, Sipotwala, the Phoenix serial killer. Sipotwala raped and murdered 16 women and was convicted in 1999. He started raping and murdering women in 1996 after luring them with the promise of a job in Durban beachfront hotels. Sipo would take these women through the sugarcane fields of Phoenix as a shortcut to the city of Durban, but when they got far enough into the sugarcane field, he would then attack them, bind them with their own underwears, rape them, and then strangle them to death. And sometimes he would use a rock to bash their face in. Sipo relied on the destruction of evidence through the burning of sugarcane fields, and he knew that without evidence, there is no case and there is no suspect. Unfortunately for Sipo, one of the bodies was found unburnt and underneath it had physical evidence that led to his arrest. Sipo Twala was then arrested during a dawn raid at his shack in Besting in 1997 after a DNA evidence matched him with all the victims that were found on the sugarcane field. On the 31st of March 1999, Sipotwala was found guilty and sentenced to 506 years in prison. At number 3, Cedric Marke, also known as the Wemapan serial killer. 
Cedric Marquez was convicted of 27 murders. Cedric Marquez started his crime spree by robbing taxi drivers and tailor shop owners. Not long after starting robbing tailor shops, he escalated to murdering his victims by bludgeoning them with a hammer on the head. When he thought that the police were after him, he would change tactics and started to target couples in Wemapan, west of Johannesburg. He would shoot and kill the men in the presence of the women and make them to watch while he did so. After killing the men, he would then drag the women into the bush in Wemapan and rape them. And after raping them, he would either shoot them or he would strangle them to death. In total, he murdered 27 people. Although some think that he murdered more than 27 people between 1996 and 1997. At first, the police did not link his attacks on the tailor shop owners as well as Wemapan killing. The police thought it was two separate serial killers on the loose. Eventually, Cedric Marke was arrested in December of 1997 as a suspect for the Wemapan murders. When Cedric was caught, he did not deny the murders. However, in court, he pleaded not guilty to all the charges leveled against him. On the 6th of September of 2000, Cedric Marke was found guilty as charged and sentenced to 1,340 years in prison. At number 2, Rosemary Lovu, the life insurance serial killer. Rosemary Lovu was a South African police service officer who hired a hitman to do a hit on his own blood sister. This case got South Africans shook to their core. To this day, she is still the topic of discussion on dinner tables and also had us all look at each other with a side eye. Rosemary Lovu had organized hitmen to kill her family members for life insurance money that she claimed for herself. By the time Rosemary Lovu was caught, six of her family members had been ruthlessly killed from 2012 to 2018. Of the six killed family members, one was her own sister and father of her daughter. Rosemary Lovu had received little over 1.4 million rand in life insurance claims. Rosemary Lovu's killing spree of family members came to an end after she ordered her second sister's killing with her five children, the youngest being only five months old. The hitman was so horrified that he decided to go report her to the police who organized a string operation collaborating with the hitman telling the hitman to continue with the job but make sure that she is not suspicious that the police were onto her the sting operation worked and rosemary lovu was arrested and during her trial rosemary faced six counts of murder four counts of fraud defeating the ends of justice and eight counts of conspiracy to commit murder. Rosemary Lovu was found guilty and sentenced to six life terms in prison. And at number one is Moses Sitole, the ABC serial killer. Moses Sitole ruthlessly murdered 38 people between 16 July 1994 and 6 November 1995. By his account, Moses Sitole was arrested for rape and sentenced to seven years in prison. Moses later blamed his conviction and imprisonment for turning him into a raging murderer. Moses Sitole explained his crimes and said that the women that he murdered all reminded him of the woman that had falsely accused him of rape resulting with his arrest and seven years in prison. By 1995, Moses Sitole had killed over 30 women, shaking the entire newly born country of South Africa from apartheid to constitutional democracy. 
the previous year when South Africa's first black president Nelson Mandela was elected. President Nelson Mandela himself visited the communities of Boxburg, east of Johannesburg, South Africa, appealing to them that if they came if they ever came across the serial killer, they should in unity apprehend the killer and hand him over to the police. However, he did warn the community to not take the law into their own hands lest they become criminals and murderers themselves. Moses Sitole's modus operandi was to lure women with the promise of a job at his successful company where he was employing women for positions of cleaning, office work and other jobs. He would then walk with these women into an isolated field telling these women that it was a shortcut to his company. Desperate for work and also Moses being so well put together and good looking, charming, they were charmed and agreed to walk with him into this isolated field where he would then turn around and attack them by tying them with their own clothes and raping them then strangle them with a piece of their underwear. In October of 1995, Moses Sitole found out that he was being sought after by the police and so he decided to call into the Star newspaper. The Star newspaper is a Johannesburg or Gauteng based daily newspaper in Johannesburg and spoke to a journalist and identified himself as the serial killer whom everybody is looking for. The journalist, in collaboration with the police, managed to capture Moses Sitole after Moses Sitole had attempted to attack one of the undercover police. On the 5th of December 1997, Moses Sitole was sentenced to 2,410 years in prison. The court ruled that Moses Sitole would have to serve at least 930 years to become eligible for parole. He would be 963 years old. Well, that is it guys, 10 most ruthless South African serial killers. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like as this helps my channel with the algorithm. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and don't forget to click the bell notification so you get notified every time I upload a new true crime video. Please leave me a comment down below and let me know what your thoughts about this list and also rearrange the list any way you like. I would like to know your thoughts. I would highly appreciate it if you share this video far and wide. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time with a new true crime video. Goodbye.